Today we're starting Ephesus, the, the letter to the Ephesians. And uh, before we start the letter, we want to review. We need to review the place of this letter. And the, the chart that we had, remember how many letters we said that St. Paul wrote? We had a little talk about that in the beginning of the letter to the Philippines. After that, there are 14, right? And we said, are they 14 or 13? 13 with one that the people are doubtful about the origin because St. Paul wrote not, didn't wrote, write his name. He writes his name in every letter. Except that one letter, he doesn't write his name in it, which is the letter to the mm -hmm. Hebrews. Hebrews. Uh, it is put at the end of the letters, the last letter of St. Paul in the Bible. When you go chronologically, I mean not chronologically, in the order of books, after the book of Acts, you have Romans, then you have Corinthians, and goes on, 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 and ends with the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, Every letter, Paul writes his name, as if he's signing the letter. So he says, Paul the servant, or the bond servant of Jesus Christ to the church in the Corinthians. Paul the servant of Jesus Christ to the church in Philippians. It is written by Paul at the end. Paul's name is found in every single one of them, except the Hebrews. Okay? So, if you count the Hebrews as belonging to Paul, there's a lot to say that this is actually belonging to Paul. There's a lot of Paul theology in it. From theology, it actually belongs to Paul. Some people say it might be one of his students, close person connected with St. Paul. Some people say it might be Apollos. Apollos learned from Aquila and Priscilla, and they were disciples of St. Paul. So, he said it could be somebody connected with St. Paul that wrote that letter. So, let's put that aside. Now, can we kind of say what letters St. Paul wrote, give me the 13. So the Hebrews is the debatable origin one that, it is a letter, it is something from the Bible, but we don't know who wrote it. Thessalonians. Uh, it's St. Paul. No, what's that? Thessalonians. Thessalonians. Can we say them in order as if they're put in the Bible? Romans. Romans. First and second. Remember I said three couples, right? I remind you again. So three couples. First and second Corinthians. First and second Thessalonians, then Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, right, so these are the four singles, right? And then after that, another couple, right, which is first and second Thessalonians, now we said it, we said we said Corinthians at the beginning, the Salinas after the fourth. So two, four, two, right? And then after that there's another couple, first and second, Timothy, Timothy and then Titus, Titus, and then Philemon. And then the, the one that, that we end with is Hebrew. Uh, when you want when I ask what are the imprisonment letter, and now in chronological order, they are written when St. Paul was in prison. There were two times that St. Paul was in prison. Most people would agree that he was in prison twice. The first time is 63 to 67. This was mentioned in the book of Acts. But apparently after that he was released, then was imprisoned again in 68, and after that one he was executed. And the first time he wrote those four letters, which are <coughs> Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. Remember, the, the two PHs, Philemon and Philippians, and the Colossians and Ephesians. And we're going to do the Ephesians today. So we're going to study the imprisonment letters in order. And then the second time, it was the second Timothy. In between, when he was free, he free wrote first Timothy and Titus. Remember, just to make things so, if you, if you want to just focus on this, give it a, a second to sink in. Just give it a second to sink in, that there, there is uh, four, two, and one, which is seven, all together. Uh, I didn't write Hebrews here. We don't know when it was written. People, they say, if it is not St. Paul, it would have been written just immediately before the destruction of Jerusalem. That's Hebrew. When we come to it, we'll talk about it. I don't want you to think about it right now. But seven letters 
from the first imprisonment. And out of the 13, you have six before. Those letters that was in the first imprisonment was Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. Two when he was released, 1 Timothy and Titus. One in his second imprisonment just before he was executed. Something to remember. Most probably, why he has all the individual letters, like Philemon, Timothy, and Timothy and Titus. I remind myself, they were all imprisonment or in between imprisonment in the later part of his service because they were companions in the first part. But apparently as he was ending his service, he started to put them in their places. They were settling down. He would send Titus to be a bishop of somewhere. He would send Philemon to be a bishop somewhere. He would send, I mean, and not Philemon especially, I'm talking about Timothy, to be a bishop of somewhere. Timothy was his companion. He was going with him all, all, all around in the journeys. But now it's about time for him to be settled. And he would give him responsibility. Then, then you can send him a letter. Why would you send a letter to your companion if he's with you? Right? Does that make sense to you? So that's why they are put in this time where he is going to be in prison. And he has to send letters to those people because he is not seeing them anymore. <coughs> and the first imprisonment again, remember, Timothy is still there in this area. So he's going to be not with him in 67 and 68 before his second imprisonment and during it. But in the first imprisonment, he's sending it to Philemon and, uh, because he was not... Uh, with him in that one. It, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. Those are the four in his first imprisonment. So that is 63. St. Paul was, uh, was martyred in 67, 68. Okay. So this is the first thing we need to talk about. Places of these, the, the, the places of these letters. Um, if this is the Mediterranean, now I just need to move this way so you can see. Any, anything about this? Is that simple? Okay, and the, the ages of it on the timeline. I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, precise, but at least you know the time zone. I wrote the Galatians here in the Nelson map book. We have Galatians with question mark in two times. It's very difficult to think that Galatian was living during his first missionary service. This is his mi mi first missionary trip. I just have a hard time believing that he wrote a letter during his fir first missionary trip because it, he was just getting <coughs> acquainted with the places. Not yet. This is where before even the Council of Jerusalem in 50. So it would have to be there, most probably there, and uh, after the Council of Jerusalem. Um, in the map, you have Egypt here, and then when the, this is the Mediterranean, when the eastern side of the Mediterranean is curving up, you got Jerusalem just around the corner, where it is north, south, Israel's north, south, like this. At the other corner up would be Antioch, Syria. Okay, Syria, that's where you get the name Antiochian Church. It's, it's a Syrian church. Then Tarsus, where Paul was born and was raised up as a Jew in the diaspora. You got Lystra. That's a famous name, right? Very famous. Everybody knows Lystra. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. <laughs> and old Lystra. old Lystra. And then there's another Antioch. They call Antioch Bisidia. Bisidia is a, is a, is a, a province of Galatia. What is Galatia? I wrote it in green to make this whole area Galatia. Land of milk. Is it the name? That's what it means? This is all Galatia. And it has smaller provinces under this big name. Galatia is opposed to Macedonia. Macedonia is this. So what is Galatia? Is part of Asia or Asia Minor. Asia Minor, right? Galatia is Turkey. And it has a little extension like a, a unicorn. You can see this shape of a head with a little horn. That meets another little horn from Macedonia. This is where Turkey 
and grease meat and a little small water mm -hmm. that's called the bisphor, right? This would be the Black Sea. And this is the Aegean Sea. Uh, Troy would be on this side, and the Greek would be on the other side. There were the Trojans attacked or were attacked by the Greek. Athens would be here. Ephesus would be here. So Ephesus here. While when you cross over, the closest part to you, when the first city would meet you in Macedonia, would be Philippi, and then Thessalonia, then um, Athens. When you go down, there's a little peninsula. It's connected with the mainland. That's in, where Corinth is. Then Italy comes after this part of the Mediterranean. Italy comes with Rome on the western side of this peninsula of Italy. And these are the major parts. So again, the Mediterranean Sea, you have Alexandria here in the south, Jerusalem at the bottom of the right side, Antioch at the top, Antioch Syria, to differentiate from Antioch Bisidea, which is part of Turkey. And then you have Tarsus and Lystra, there is also other one, Iconium, and then Ephesus at the almost the nose of the unicorn. And then opposite to Ephesus would be um, uh, Athens. On the north side would be Philippi and Thessalonia. And south would be Corinth. And this would be the Black Sea. And then Rome would be here. I want you to be familiar with this so as you would read in the book of Acts and in the letters also you know what, what to expect and where things are. So let's go and open the, 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 the Bible to this beautiful letter, one of the very poetic, very beautiful, very romantic almost letters. And, and, and uh, most people thinking Philippians and Ephesians are the most general letters of St. Paul. They speak to all churches. There was not a, sig a significant um, problem or heresy that St. Paul was trying to fight. If there is a piece in Ephesians, before we start, if you pick a verse from Ephesians, and I'm going to keep saying this until we end because I want you not to forget this, uh, that actually highlights the whole letter. Which one would that be? You all know it, by the way. I am, I am sure you all know it. Chapter 6, you know it for sure. Any chapter could actually... Four. I give it up. Okay. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all loneliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there, are, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Why are we so familiar with this one? Why is this? If you read in any commentary, in anybody who reads this epistle, this letter, well, tell you, this verse is actually the highlight of this letter. And why is that? Because, and that's why I think I need to introduce this letter to you by saying, this is the piece we read in the morning hour, Agbeya. This is every morning before we start the Agbeya. This is what the church had put before us to read. If you open your Agbeyas, and in the morning you start, before reading the first hour, this is what you would read. Why? Because this is, the icon of the church. You want to describe the church? And I want to start with this as my introduction. Then we'll go to talk about something else. Let's list what he's saying here. He said, 
First of all, he calls himself the prisoner of the Lord. Prisoner of the Lord means he is, again, in, in chains, right? Uh, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. So he's saying there's a calling that God is in calling us for. With all lawlessness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Um, there is one body and one Spirit, as you were called, and one hope of your calling. So let's go count the ones. What makes us as a church one? So he starts list with me. There is one. Body, right? Yep. Two. Spirit. One. Spirit. Three. One. Next would be? One hope. As you call it to one hope? One faith. One baptism. One faith. One faith. One baptism. One baptism. One God and Father. One God and Father. I'm missing something. One Lord. One Lord. What is that? Was it where? It's before one faith. One Lord, yeah, it's before one faith. So it should be here. Four. One Lord. So that gives him seven. Exactly. He knows what he's doing. And the Holy Spirit knows what he's doing too. It has to be seven. So, why is this piece important and why is it the... Because this letter is about the church. That's just to get to the bottom of it. Remember what we said? Remember what I said about... Uh, uh, this is a, something that we need to review too. Each of those is a subject. Do you remember what the Thessalonians were about? <coughs> Thessalonians were, that's the tough one. Thessalonians were about the second coming of Christ, the end of days. What about the Corinthians, the subject of Corinthians? Disputes in the community. This, the immorality, fighting immorality within the church. What to do when you have bad stuff happening inside the church? How about the Galatians? Judaizers. The Judaizers are trying to become become uh, converts to Judaism first before they become a Christian. Romans, it's the Gospel of Saint Paul, reconciling Jews and Gentiles. Ephesians is the church, and the church in the mind of Saint Paul. What is a church? And I'm going to make a very important statement today that I want you all to remember. Colossians, it is the cosmic Christ. Who is Christ to the whole cosmos? The word, the logos. Philemon, it's a, a personal reconciliation of Philemon to his own servant, and becomes an example for all the dealings of masters and servants in the church. Philippians, unity, right? The mind of Christ, how to be, become one. Timothy, first and second, it's about bishops and priests and deacons. What do the servants of the church do? Titus is also deals with the the ministry of the of the bishop. What does the bishop remind them, teach them, tell them? Okay, but Ephesians is a church. So when I ask, what is the definition of the church? Before we go there, so let's just do the definition. What's a church? Uh, what is a church? <coughs> Most people would say yes. Well, they, they sometimes say they start with the word, and they say you, you have a public building, and you call the ecclesia, and people come. So it's a place where people come who hear the call. Right. Uh, so we can define the church as a place? Mm -hmm. You could, or where people are gathered for a, okay. com a common message. They, they heard a call and they came. The evangelical would be very angry with that statement. They would tell you the church is not a building. No. Well, they heard a call and they came to a group. Right. Then it is the group. The people who believe. It's the people of God. Right? 
It is not the best because the, the, the argument is true because in the first first century you couldn't have a place. Okay, well, you put a roof over the people. They do. Yeah, exactly. They can they can meet actually in the river by river by river uh, bed or uh, in a place in a public place even even in the cemetery, wherever they meet. But it is the the people of God, it's the group of believers. That's the definition. But is that enough? What makes them the ecclesia of Christ? The unity. Just... This. This is what makes them an ecclesia. And then, as, a, as an orthodox, I, says, I say, it is the one body, the one spirit, the one hope, the one Lord, the one faith, the one baptism, and the one God and Father. That makes that group of believers. So, they need a body. And who and what is that body? What is the definition of that one body? In an orthodox mind, it is? That is? The? Body of Christ. The? What, what makes us the body of Christ that we share in the? Communion. Eucharist. Here. Thank you. Yeah. The Eucharist is what makes us the one body. Because St. Paul is going to spit it out. It's not our words. In the Corinthians, he says, we are one because we share in one loaf. I think it's in the Corinthians. Take my word on it before we go and spend time on it. So don't want to waste your time. <laughs> he says, we are one because we come to one loaf of bread to take from it. It is not like I can get five loaves or ten loaves, everybody's going to have to take his own loaf. No, we share one loaf of bread to become one body. So what makes us one body? Maybe I should get it. Actually, I should. And I, I think I should. Well, that just for documentation. Don't laugh at me. Let's go to uh, First Corinthians. I just opened it. It's very interesting. First Corinthians, Corinthians twelve, chapter twelve, verse twelve. of the body. Yes, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For what by that one spirit we were called, we're all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks. It starts in baptism. Um, let me go to... Can you look it up for me, please? The one low. It would be there, yes. That's, it's in first Corinthians too. 17. Oh, yeah. 17. For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So this is the source of our one body. To become one body, we have to partake of that one. And, and it's one bread, he says. Um, and then he says, 
um, before that actually in uh, in in uh, 14 and following therefore my beloved flee from idolatry I speak as to wise men judge for yourselves what I say the cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ the bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ for we though many are one bread and one body for we all partake of that one bread and it means one loaf observe Israel and then he goes to say something very impressive just think about this verse that's coming we're going to talk about this in Corinthians understand the coming part because I want you to pay attention to it to get the he, he has a table in his mind there's a table he says observe Israel after the flesh are not those who eat of the sacrifices partake of the altar when I what am I saying then it's a riddle an idol is anything or what is offered to an idol is anything rather than the things which are the entire sacrifice is sacrificed to demons and not to God I do not want you to have fellowship with demons you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons you cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons he has a comparison between two items yes three items why seven and we have number four and number seven are the same I one Lord, Lord, one God. One Lord, one God. I'll tell you that in a second. What is the three things that's comparing in this passage? He said, you cannot be a partaker of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Mm -hmm. And he says, Israel, according to the flesh, have an altar. <laughs> and they eat of that altar and they become partaker of the altar. So it's a table. He's comparing what? The table of... Christ, which he could not say an altar because they, they would confuse the Christians, <coughs> to the altar of the Israelites, mm -hmm. to the altar of pagans. He says each one of those, the Israelites and the pagans, are partaking of their own sacrifices and that's how they become partners, sharing one thing with each other and with their God. If that is the case, then it should apply to you too. But he you could not say it's an altar. We, can, we could say it today, because in the mind of the first Christians, it is linked to a certain rituals. Okay? Let me just leave this aside, because I think it will get you too deep into something else. What I'm trying to say here, in, in St. Paul theology, it is the source of being, but one body is, do we agree? Is community. Okay. Which will give me part of this definition of the church? Let's go back. It is the group of believers, now I have to add one item after this definition, is surrounding the table. The table. That's important. So it has the believers around the table where the body of Christ is. Good. Next. The question about the Lord, God, and the Father. That question is, uh, would get us into a discussion about Trinity. In St. Paul terminology, he calls God the Father, God, Father. He calls Christ, Lord. So the Father is the one that nobody saw. He sends his Son to be the head, the visible head of the church. And the, 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 the Christ becomes the, the groom, the head of a body, the, the husband of a wife. And say, in Ephesians, we're going, to, we're going to hear this very clearly. And then he becomes the one that shows us the quality of the Father that we have never seen. So we need both. We need the Spirit. See, we need actually three of them. The Spirit, we need the Lord, and we need the Father. Somebody said it. He said that it takes three persons to save one. Right? It takes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to, to save me. So one body, what about one spirit? We actually have one spirit. That means we're motivated, we're energized, we're enlivened by one source of life. And that source of life is... So if we said this is the Eucharist, what's this? Confirmation. Confirmation. That is... That is the Holy Spirit that we give in the laying of hands of the Apostles. All of us, when Abuna or the Apostles or the Bishop breathed on us or laid hands. <coughs> uh, 
about this Eucharist. How about one hope? Remember that big talk we had about hope? What is, what is that we all hope, one hope? When he talks about it, he means the Lord's coming. Exactly. So the hope of the coming of Christ to take us to that better life. That life that does not end. That life that is so excellent and so beyond the imagination of human mind. So this is about eternity. We await the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. We await. It's eagerness to wait. How about one Lord? We call him Lord. At the end of the Eucharist, uh, the liturgy, we say, Christos ben noti. Some of us don't know what that means. Christos ben noti means our Lord. Ben noti, ben noti means our Lord. Christ is our Lord. It's a, a priestly confirmation. And in all the churches, they make that confirmation from the beginning of time of the church. Before they leave, they make sure that every one of us proclaim why. Christ Lord. Christ is Lord. Why? Because you're going to go, get out and be persecuted in the, in the time of the first Christians. We may not want to make sure that you actually have that confirmation with you before you get out and being asked about who is your Lord. The Christos Pernoti. And then the answer is, Amen. Yes, He is. I mean, let it be. Yes, He is. So, one faith. What, what do you say to that? What makes a church is one faith. Great. Thank you. Greek. It's very concrete, actually. You think about it. There is no uh, guessing. There is no guessworks here. The church has made things very concrete for us. You have one body that's the Eucharist, one spirit that is the spirit that we've given in our confirmation, one hope it is the waiting for the resurrection and the life of age to come, one Lord that is Jesus, I mean, uh, it's a Shobi, one faith that is the creed. What about one baptism? This is simple, straightforward. One God and Father, this is simple. Okay? So this is what makes the... the For Christ, he had... I want to just say this. He had done something to the church. And St. Paul is going to do this also. He had instituted in his place apostles. He said to him, to the apostles, um, before, as the Father had sent me, I... Send you. Send you. That means he's transferring his privileges as a lord of the church. Now we get the bishops. So in an orthodox definition of a church and an icon of the church, you got uh, the Eucharist, you got the believers, excuse my drawing skills, and then you got the bishop. So it is the icon of the church. Why now? I'm going to change that question. Where do you find this icon? Where do you actually have it literally drawn? Where do you see it? Thank you. It is the icon of the Last Supper on top of the of the altar in all the you know the the the, the original churches. You know, Catholic and Orthodox. Why do we have the icon of the Last Supper on top of the door of the altar all the time? Why? Because that is actually the definition of the church. You cannot have it better than that. You have the Eucharist, you have the believers, you have the bishop. In the time of the apostles, the believers were the twelve apostles. And the body was the bread and wine in front of him. And their bishop was Jesus himself. When he's going to leave, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to take the bread and break it in their own communities, and they will give it from generation to generation to generation until the end of times. And this becomes the church. And that's why I think this verse, the church had put in the beginning of the day for us. And that's why he says, this is the calling you're called for. You're called to this, to become one through this. And then he says, try very hard to keep that unity in the bond of peace. Keep that unity within yourself in that bond that you uh, ought to keep. So this, saying this, and I think, would be a good introduction to this book. Now, you, if you go into uh, the, the letter, he will go about his own vision. 
and his own feelings about what the church means to St. Paul. Any questions? So this is how I think I like to introduce this letter. But, um, Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the word of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, like I said, it's a signature. Paul's name is a signature in the letter. You know that he wrote this letter. Very clear, there is no dispute over the letters writer. But then notice this, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. When Ananias, the Christian in Damascus, you remember the story of his conversion? Ananias, who was a, a, a priest, an elder in the church of Damascus, Paul came to him, uh, was Saul of Tarsus, and he was blind, and he, he visited Paul in his place, and he said to him, God has chosen you to hear words from the Holy One. Who, who chosen him? It is actually the Father. For Paul to hear things. Okay, thank you. <laughs> to hear words from Christ. I will, I will lose attention. <laughs> but isn't it, yeah? <laughs> I, I would lose attention myself. Okay, to hear things from Christ, he was chosen by God the Father. This is what he's saying. The Father has chosen him to hear from, from uh, the mouth of Christ. And he calls the Ephesians saints and faithful in Christ Jesus. That's what we ought to be called, all of us. Saints because we are sanctified by the Holy Spirit and by the body of Christ. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we said that. Why grace and peace? Peace and grace? Because grace is the common greeting in or to the Christians. To the Gentiles. Gentiles always talk about grace. Charisma. Charis. And what, what about peace? Shalom. That's the Hebrew salutation. So when he calls peace and grace, he's actually greeting both Hebrews and Gentiles. From both our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here you notice in the theology of St. Paul, he doesn't confuse like we do today. And this is common in our church, that we confuse the language and use for the Father and Son. Paul doesn't. And the church in its language when in prayer doesn't. We, we grew up, because of the Islamic pressure, unfortunately, uh, to force ourselves to talk to God as a single entity. And I was uh, talking about this with a person recently about how in the language of the church it's very clear. You know that in the liturgy, you, you as uh, uh, people, laity, are speaking to, to, to Christ. As, but, but the priest is actually speaking to the Father. Just pay attention. You both, the priest and you, come to talk to the Father in one spot, and one spot by itself when both the priest and the deity come to talk to God, the Father. And that spot is our Father. But until then, you're speaking to Christ, you're interceding with saints to Christ, because you cannot intercede with saints to the Father. And then, at the end, when Jesus' body is broken, and we remember the cross, we all lift up the broken body of Christ and say, Our Father. Because we remember the resurrection, the cross and the resurrection, when Jesus stood there, at the tomb, and he said, go tell my disciples, I go to my father and your father. Now he becomes your father and my father. So he doesn't confuse the two. Blessed be the God and the fa and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now he's going to start this very difficult piece. 
and I'm hoping to get through it quickly before you get tired because it's really difficult. Every time I go through this, it is so rich, it's almost like uh, butter. Too much butter. So we have to kind of digest it in slow pieces. First of all, he says, bless who has blessed us. Bless who has blessed us. Bless God. We say, we bless you in the liturgy, right? We say that to Christ. We praise you. We bless you. What does it mean to bless God? You know, he blesses us all the time. What does it mean to bless God? And we need to get into that. We really do. <coughs> for God to bless us, it's a, it's a pleasure for him. Imagine, I'm going to give you a picture. That you see your children, and you, so, you get so emotional. You just want to get your heart out and give it to them. You want to give, give your, your eyes out to them. You want to just get kind of, you don't know what to do. And you bring them closer to you, give them a hug, and you kiss them. And say, what do you want from me today? Just ask anything. That is an, an emotion that is so profound and so powerful that it takes all of you to do. To bless God is exactly the same. So he's doing this to us, and we in turn, we do the same once we feel his love. So if we are able to do that, uh, it is an, an emotion of the heart. It is not something that we say with our mouth. It's actually an action of the heart, an abundant emotion that overflows out of the feeling that we are very much blessed. That's why the action and the, the reaction are almost the same. Blessed be God and the Father who had blessed who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So what does in the heavenly places mean? You notice this from now on in this letter that Everything is done in Christ. Everything. And the God, the God the Father is going to do this in Christ. Not outside Christ. And this is going to solve an, a, a, an issue, but I have to understand what that means. I think one of the places that helped me to understand it from the psalm, from the uh, first hour. And the second psalm says, Kiss the Son, lest the list uh, God uh, get angry means I have to love the Son, I have to embrace the Son, I have to take the Son into my heart and my life. Otherwise, nothing would help. So without having Christ, these blessings that God has given and everything that He wants to give will find no place. So to to get the spiritual blessings, it is through Christ. And it's in the heavenly places. How, what do you understand from the heavenly places? I imagine it this way. God the Father sits in His court, in the royal court in heaven. Myriads and thousands and billions and millions of angels and creatures in heaven. Sometimes no, nobody can describe what they are. In the, in, the, in the birth of Christ, they say, a heavenly host, the Gospel of St. Luke. Suddenly, heavenly hosts appear. What, what do you mean, heavenly hosts? Apparently, they couldn't call them angels. Heavenly hosts is like creatures that sing. And most probably, their singing was beyond description. Before that, all this multitude, God is blessing us. These are my children. They love my son, and for them, I, I pour everything that I have. For them, I give everything that I have. Yeah. St. Paul, in other places, says, if he has given us his son, wouldn't he give us everything else with him? Mm -hmm. Then he goes again, again, this is crazy, just as, so he blessed us in Christ, just as he has chose us in him. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. And that verse solved a problem, big problem. It is the Calvinistic problem, I call it. And that's how I call it. The choice, is it God's or ours? 
do we really have a choice or it is God's selection, right? Are we pre-selected, pre-packed, like uh, produce in the marketplace, tomatoes, and <laughs> are we veggies, <laughs> like the vegetables? <laughs> <laughs> or, or we have a free will that we actually can pick our own choices. And the, the way to solve this is this one. That when we choose Christ, we are already pre-selected. That solution comes in that one person. I pick Christ, the Father picks me. So the choice is both, God and me. But I have to pick Christ. Without picking Christ, I will not be selected. So I'm asking a question. Some people come to me, and this is actually another question that's very practical. Somebody says to me, how do I know that God actually wants me to go to heaven? How do I know that God loves me? Maybe that God rejects me. He doesn't like me. I say, you need to, what? to do what? What's the solution? <coughs> exactly. Yeah, ask yourself, do you love Christ? Do you love Him? Do you really think that Christ is your Lord? Do you call Him? Christos uh, Pennoti, Christ my Lord, if you do, then that's it, you're selected, that's it. That doesn't mean that I am assured of a, you know, that's different, right? Exactly, this is totally different. But it means at this point of time, as I select Christ and continue to select Him, I am also selected, because in Him, I am selected. That's the solution to this riddle. I am selected because I select Christ. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. And this drives anybody nuts. What do you mean without blame? I am without blame? That is That is really crazy. Think about it. That God sees us without blame. In Egypt they have a, 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 a saying, they say, a child in the sight of their mother is a monkey in the sight of their mother is a gazelle, <laughs> a, a, a deer, <laughs> or a beautiful animal. <laughs> but you know, monkeys are beautiful in their own right, right? <laughs> so, in God's sight, we are blameless. And this is a big subject in itself. St. Paul is just putting too much into this few words. I'm telling you, it's butter, but this one is, I don't know what you call it. I know what's richer, richer than butter. <coughs> the whole problem of, the whole problem of the garden and the temptation was this. This. Remember when God said, I will make man in my own image and likeness? What is the image and likeness of God? It's perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. The image and likeness of God is perfection. The devil comes to say, God doesn't want you to eat from the tree, or that's an implied thought, because if you eat from, that's what he said, when you eat from it, you will be like God. Implied, you're not, right now you're not like God, you need to eat. So there's something about you that is not perfect. He's you're, holding back. Exactly. God is not loving you enough, and you're not good enough, after all. And this is our problem. I believe each one of us sitting here, you cannot deny, this is personal. I'm, I'm talking to you personally. This is our problem. If you really believe this verse, that you're blameless before God, you'll be a saint. You'll be transformed into a saint immediately. Why? This is what happens when people repent, actually. The repentance comes from the encounter of the Samaritan woman with Jesus, for example. She meets him. And she finds herself, what's the word? <coughs> blameless. He doesn't blame her for anything. Okay, what does that mean? That means God, who is showing himself in Christ, does not hold us ugly or wicked or, you know, disgusting or any of that stuff. It is our own thinking of our own self through the encounters we make in the world. And that's what the devil is trying to do yeah, all the time. The devil is trying to do to sell us <coughs> cheap things to draw us away from the father like the prodigal son. And then the new back, where it hits the worst. 
So to get to the pig sty, and then you start seeing yourself new. So blameless is the key. That's the key of the gospel of the whole Bible, to be blameless in God's sight. It doesn't mean that, so I say this, and I want all of us to focus on this, because this will get us right in our own mind. We look to our parents, we look to our friends, we look to our teachers, we look to our priests, we look to our uncles and grandfathers to have approval, to find ourselves blameless. Because we're looking very hard for that. Because we're looking for God. That's what it is. But then we make, we make the biggest mistake by selling ourselves to these people. And then they will always tell us, you're not good enough. Always. You're not good enough. And then we get scared, we get afraid, and we, uh, we get hurt, and we don't want to do anything. If we feel blameless, we're very brave. We're very energetic. We're filled with zeal for God. We want to do things. You want to change things. You, you don't care what people say about you. You become a martyr. Martyrs didn't care what everybody would say about them. So, so blameless that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And how is he going to do this? Through washing us, cleansing us, sanctifying us. Bestowing the Spirit upon us, filling with his, us with, Holy, with the Holy Spirit, so I have the thoughts of God. And then the more I advance in this, the more I actually despise everything else the world would give me as a substitute. So in, in verse 5 he says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself. Again, and the key verse is predestination here, it lies on a foundation he already laid. Predestined us means he had foreseen that we are going to go there based on selection in Christ. That I actually, he, he predestined us in, as adoption, a son by Jesus Christ. So he said, my son, this is the father, go down. I want you to prepare yourself to take it into yourself as your body. Everybody who comes to you. John 6. John 6 is very important. So he says, that's the will of the Father, that who sees the Son and believe in Him will have life. Means they have to see Him and believe. So if, if they see you and believe in you, give them your sonship. Exchange with you, share with them your own sonship. Then the Father had already predestined those who would see and believe into sonship. It's almost like, okay, I'm going to put it uh, in a very feeble, very weak example. Um, uh, an owner of a store who says uh, if somebody comes on this weekend the second weekend in March I'll give them uh, one extra merchandise for free but only the people that comes so those who are on a, on a destiny with this buying the merchandise and on a destiny with a surprise they are predestined for but it, you would have to go to the mall. You would have to select the merchandise to get the, to get the prize. But in a way, we are predestined to get the prize by setting up this item. So God has in Christ. That's why it keeps saying it in Jesus Christ. This is not something that I do outside Him. Not predestination before meeting Jesus. It is after I meet Christ. So in Him, again in Him, be distant us to adoption by as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. What is according to the good pleasure of his will? Means that's very pleasing to him. Very, very pleasing to him to do this, this to us. That we become children. That we become children of God. And that's why in, the, in Jesus Christ we have the adoption. And if you want to know, and the uh, second great curriculum, uh, we, we, we put there the ingredients. And the most important ingredient of the adoption is the communion, is the Eucharist. Because in that Eucharist, we share in the Sonship of Christ, and we are filled with the grace of Sonship. Now, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved Keep. Repeating, you see that what's repeating again? N, N. This 
proposition, this little letter N, N Him, in the Beloved, in Jesus Christ, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Who is going to praise the glory of His great grace? We. And then who else? Heaven. All heaven. You remember when Jesus said, For heaven rejoice over one sinner returning more than 99 righteous one who doesn't. So heaven rejoices when we actually get the praise. Not just they praise God. They say holy, holy to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit because of what is going on with us. I, uh, I, I sometimes think of it in this uh, sarcastic way. I say, they look at us and say, what would God do with these? Oh, you know? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> <thinking? laughs> exactly. And then they see what's happening. Wow! That God can make really miracles. Because He creates from dust something very weak and very feeble and very nonsense. Nothing. And then nonsense, I mean. And then after that, He makes something very good out of it. And it becomes glorious. It becomes like Him. Then this is a miracle. And in another place, it says the whole creation, St. Paul in Romans, he says the whole creation awaits the glory that will be revealed in us. That's Romans 8. He says the whole creation, everything, and everything and single thing in heaven and earth waits for the revelation of what will happen to us in the day of resurrection. Something very big. So, um, I'm going to go one more verse, uh, two actually, all the way to eight. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. In Him again. Can anybody count in how many ends do we have? From verse 3. Not in love, I'm talking in Christ, or in Jesus, or in His Son, or in the Beloved. Where are you stopping? In uh, five. You counted five? Yeah. So the first one is? In the heavenly places, in Christ. in Christ, the second one, in Him, in Him, in him. Uh, <laughs> in him which is in, in verse number four. four, and then five, that's number, that's two. You can count from one. Let's see. Yes. Yeah, that would be three now. Three. Which one? Number one. Verse one has it too. In Christ Jesus. was in Christ Jesus. That we are in Christ. Yes. Three. In the beloved, in six. That's four. In Him, that's seven. That's five, right? Which He made. Uh, so in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made, having made known to us the mystery. I'm going to stop at eight. So, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and pr all prudence. The redemption. So he talks about adoption and redemption as two, uh, two words that He used, adoption and redemption. What is adoption and what is redemption? Adoption, there is a, there is a, an, a, a, a first adoption, and there is a, almost a second adoption. I'm going to put it this way. I don't know what theology would call it. First adoption is what? You are my son. Exactly. You are my beloved son, in whom I am well. He just said it, right? And he is to be pleased in us, to be, see us blameless. Where is that? Where is that heard before? In baptism, you are my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. So when I am baptized into Christ, I'm hearing, you 
the same thing. You know, I'm my beloved son. This is the first adoption. But look at me. You know, I'm still like everybody else. I sweat, sweat and tire and sleep and, you know, I need all what others need. And then people look at me and they try to convince me, you're like any one of us, what you call it, adoption. You're not the child of God. Give me a pick. So when is going to be the full adoption? When my body is going to be transformed to take on the glorious body of Christ. Then that's the full adoption. Actually, there's a, a psalm, second psalm, that we, St. Paul used for the resurrection. You are my son, today I have begotten you. He talks about the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. Jesus was born into humanity to become a son of man. Although he was a son of God, but he calls himself always a son of man. In the resurrection, there was a full revelation of, a full display of God's adoption. Because he was still hungry, still tired, still sleep, still die, still bleed. But then after the resurrection, what happens? No more of that. Even our body, even our human nature that's weak, what will happen to it? Will be changing to become like God. So that's full adoption. Today it is a spiritual adoption. I only feel it in my heart, but my body is still not there. So uh, this is the adoption. What about redemption? It's <clears throat> when you buy something. Right. You pay a price for it. It was a very big price. Redemption. I think about redemption when... <clears throat> and, and, and there's two ways to think about redemption. I just want you to think with me as also as an Orthodox. Because sometimes we get into different types of thinking. Redemption, I think, could be mean, meaning a court where somebody... Uh, pays the bail or uh, the, the, the uh, money to get someone out, to redeem someone from prison. Or they pay money to get a, a captive from the war or something. And the old tribes used to give them a lot of money. And all of a sudden, Egypt and the tribes in the desert, when somebody kills someone by accident, they make a deal. They make a big feast and they kill a, a, a calf or a, a, a lamb. And then the, the killer by accident will pay a big sum of money for the other. That's redemption. He's redeeming the, the person from the family that's going to take revenge. But in this case, I think it is more like somebody, go, somebody goes to the hospital to donate their kidney or their uh, piece of their liver. In the case of Christ, he gave his life, his, life, his whole body. It's whole blood. So we can get it and be children of God. So it is more of a hospital setting. What I'm trying to say, he redeemed us from what? He didn't redeem us from the devil. It's just tough to think. Who's going to take the price? Would God owe, does God owe the devil anything? Who's going to take the price? You, you can't stretch metaphors all the way. Right. They're just images. Exactly. But here what I'm saying, it is actually... To redeem us from sin and from death, all the sequences of sin, all the way to the end, to death. So what would be the price for my life? And it's just words, I think to me it doesn't hit until I go into medicine. And that's what, I'm, what I know. Medicine is when you redeem something by giving life for life. You know, you want to have body with anemia, to treat somebody with anemia, and they're bad anemia. What would you do? They're bleeding. They bleed a lot in an accident. Somebody has to donate. donate blood. That's how I know it. Somebody, their kidney functions are losing. They're, they're giving up. The kidneys are not working. What we need to do? Kidney transfer. Kidney transfer. Somebody has to donate it. So this is redeeming the person by my own flesh, my own body. To me, this is more of what Christ has done than, than to think of it as a payment given to someone. Who is going to take a payment? This is a big question. So there's... Adoption and redemption. And these are two words in St. Paul that uses this a lot. But I think in their times, because medicine was not there yet, uh, the, the transfusion is not you know, invented, uh, all these terminologies are new, new terminologies. That it fits into theology more today. But in St. Paul, he's not able to get more than these words. He just used legal terms. But it's not giving the whole... Because if you look at it in his words, 
he, you would see that he is using exactly what we talk about in medicine today. He says, he killed sin by his cross. What does that mean? Kill sin by the cross. He put an end to sin by the cross. And in another place, I'm not going to go there, too, but we're going to get over it, but I want to introduce you to those terminology. I'm going to stop. Um, um, oh, there's actually, there's one more end. Let's go. One, one more end. It's uh, in verse 11. Uh, oh, there's, uh, there's uh, the mystery. I don't want to go into the mystery. That, okay, let's read it at least. That in the dispensation, he have, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in, in himself. That's the Father. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. The, his will was a mystery. Nobody knew about it. What God's will is. Nobody knew. In the Old Testament, it seemed very, very difficult to understand. Because St. Paul is a, a Pharisee. He taught the law. He didn't understand that, what God intended from everything that was going on. Like today, people go into the Old Testament and they get confused. What well, is all about all these killings and all this? When you really dig deep, deep into the Old Testament, you get even more confused sometimes. You don't know. But until you get Christ in the picture, everything falls into place. That's what really sheds light on things. Um, and his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that's the dispensation of the fullness of the times. He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Again, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him. Who, again, he's, he's putting it first. In him we are predestined to obtain an inheritance. Um, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having been believed, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased position to the praise of his glory. That's the second redemption. We are sealed until the second. So I'm, I'm going to stop here. I just read it for us to prepare for the next time. Yes. Is there a March 24th? Not next Tuesday, but the next. Are we going to have Bible study? Sure. We're going to do that. Yes. And glory be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To make sure of the self, Father. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because we're able to say thank you. Our Father, who art in heaven, and the Father, who is 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 in heaven, and the Father, who